And we're live, barely. <coughs> Everyone's sick, and we're hanging on the best we can. But we've got a good show planned for tonight. Because the question is, what does weed do to your brain? If it didn't do anything, nobody would even care. The fact that weed affects your brain is why people love it. And that's what we're getting into tonight. So tonight we're going to go through the good, the bad, the uh, the ugly maybe. I don't know. We're going to find out. But uh, <clears throat> stay with us as we get into it all tonight. So let's uh, roll the tape, if you know what I mean. Let's bring in Josh. How you doing? Good, man. I'm, I'm doing a whole lot better after seeing how terrible you feel. I guess for, <laughs> for how, how tired and, and a little under the weather I feel. I feel it's a whole lot crazy. better than you look. So. Dude, everyone is <laughs> sick, man. I mean, it's everyone I know yeah. is sick right now. And I don't, and yeah. I don't say that facetiously. I mean, literally everyone I know is sick right now. Everyone I talk to, everybody I know, it seems like everybody's either sick right now or getting sick as we speak. So I'm sure this will be hitting me by the time we have our next show. Eh, it's all right. Fortunately, it's not too bad. We're getting through. We're just getting everything squared away. Obviously, you could tell my voice is a a little shot, but eh, that's okay. We're figuring it out. Yeah, I hear you there, uh, your digital media guy. We're all we're all hurting, but that's all right. We still got a fun topic planned for tonight. You know, maybe we'll uh, it won't run quite so long tonight, just because everyone's under the weather. But we'll see how things go. Right? There's uh, no structure here in that sense. We're just here having a good time talking about brain and spine stuff. That's interesting. If you're uh, out there in the chat, welcome to the show today. We thank you for joining us, despite our uh, being in. <clears throat> health shambles this evening but that's okay go ahead give us a wave a shout out say hello welcome to the show we're glad you're with us questions you have tell us leave them in the chat for us we'll happily answer them and uh, i guess before we get into it we'll leave our little plug uh i'm dr rat i'm joined by my good friend not a doctor josh norty and we are Brain and Spine Group Live. We're hosted by a nonprofit organization, Brain and Spine Group. If you'd like to support our nonprofit organization, which is committed to training future brain and spine doctors, we are committed to producing research that improves the future of brain and spine health. We are committed to serving our community by helping veterans with brain injuries and spine injuries, supporting patients uh, through their uh, brain and spine injuries as well. So there's a lot of great things that we're doing. If you want to support our mission, you can head over to our website, neurosurgerytraining.org slash donate and uh, leave a financial contribution. Any help that we can get at the end of the year will help us in prepping for next year because we've got a lot of stuff planned for next year that we need the support of our community to get done. Frankly, um, you know, there's real, really uh, no other way that we're able to do what we do without all of you. So if you can contribute before the year's end, we would greatly appreciate it. So with that, let's get into the stuff people actually care about. How weed affects your brain. So <clears throat> I am not a drug researcher. I am not, um, I mean, I have my undergraduate education in neuroscience, but I am not PhD trained in neuroscience. I am clinically uh trained to some degree in neuroscience and clinical neurosciences, which is very different than um, the true basic (coughs) neuroscience. They are very different. But I think there's something about, you know, at least my training that allows me to kind of understand a little bit more about (coughs) how these things affect your brain. (coughs) Although I would not in any way put myself in a category being an expert here, but Maybe we can help find some answers through uh, a little bit of enthusiasm. What uh, so what kind of things come to your mind there, Norty, when you're thinking about how weed affects the brain? Well, we all, well, not we all, but people who, who partake in, in weed legally or, you know, before it was legal, yeah, you know, I mean, it, 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 it makes you, it makes you feel a certain way, right? What and, an interesting concept, though. Yeah. Like we've literally lived, <clears throat> I always think about it, it's like the next cell phone. Right. Like how many people live? I mean, obviously tons of people, but I feel like now we live in a very dichotomous, like split world. Like people who existed before cell phones were commonplace and people who have literally never existed in this world without a cell phone. Well, I guess weed is <clears throat> on its way to becoming that next thing. You know, obviously we've both existed yeah. in a world long before weed was legal. Yeah. Well, and 
and you know you you've, there's the stereotype of like the burnout the stoner from from movies generations you know far before us and what what sparked this conversation this topic in the first place was there's clinical uses for for weed marijuana thc yeah. <laughs> and, and cannabis products in general right and that's what i i had posed the question to you i was like why is it that cannabis can be used to treat people who who have seizures because i've heard that and i don't know <coughs> how much it's been studied yeah. what the the clinical reason behind that is or you know we could even start as simple as with what's going on in the brain when somebody has a seizure is that something yeah. that's that's caused by the brain even so i guess if you want to talk about seizures first we can talk yeah. about that even though i think that the reaches of weed in the brain go far beyond seizures and, and honestly i'm i'm yeah. fascinated on the effects that all drugs have on the brain and they all have yeah. different effects and i think there's probably different reasons for why each specific drug family even uh, has an effect on the brain and this is something yeah. that that may fascinate me more than just all the other brain stuff that we've talked about so far yeah. well <clears throat> i mean the, i think the first like the way that i would put things you know like two general broad buckets is how <clears throat> synthetic versus like more like naturally grown or naturally occurring compounds and how they affect the brain i mean the reality is honestly like <clears throat> most drugs originated from some sort of organic source that then was studied to find out like what in this organic source is actually affecting the body or the brain and through that is how they identify how to basically like recreate only the part of the organic compound in a lab that has the desired effect and that's how you sort of like use organic compounds to get to synthetic compounds and the, what that basically means is that when you have organic sources of drugs, just to put things simply, you can you probably be more complicated than that. But when you have organic sources of drugs, it's not pure, right? So well, and let's 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 break this down with like real world examples, right? Like th right. there's a marijuana plant that grows out in the yeah. wilderness or it did at some point or even you go like opiates what are those derived from like poppy plants yeah or actually funny yeah. story yeah. when when uh when we first got to afghanistan they um <laughs> they do this like incoming training where they um they're basically like teaching you what to look out for in terms of like identifying people making and processing cocaine because I, you know, drug trade's huge mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. They grow tons of poppy fields, and well, yeah, that's right. Even even cocaine's derived from a plant <laughs> as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All opioids. All opioids are. Mm -hmm. But um, and so what they end up doing is they have this whole presentation, and they basically walk you through all the steps of like growing, harvesting, and manufacturing opioids. So like, and the idea is like now you'll be able to identify behaviors among people around you that maybe you think are just going about their normal day life but are actually contributing to like taliban drug trade right and at the end of the presentation i just remember like my buddy nolan looks at me he goes i think they just taught me how to make heroin so the u.s government taught uh, <clears throat> all the marines <clears throat> at least in uh 111 in 2010 how to grow manufacture and produce heroin uh that was part of our official training in afghanistan so it's actually a fascinating process it's kind of interesting you want they to walk these. us through it <laughs> mm. it's fascinating they yeah. like literally, they grow these like fields of poppies and this is the whole reason like drugs by themselves are fascinating and yeah. the effects that they have on the human body fascinating so let's I mean, honestly, that's all medicine really is. Yeah. We're just drug dealers to some yeah. degree. I, well, maybe not all medicine, right? I mean, surgery requires a lot of drugs yeah. to do surgery, but the surgery itself is not drug dealing. But if you're not a surgeon, honestly, you're more of a drug dealer than anything. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I mean, the way they literally make heroin, they like grow these fields of poppies and they have to go through and score the plant. It's like basically like damaging the plant and then the mm -hmm. plant 
basically like produces this sap yeah. to like address the like wound in the plant. And then they go by and like harvest all that sap off the poppies, roll it into like balls of tar. And that's basically like black tar heroin. Get, yeah, yeah. Black tar <laughs> heroin. Yeah. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they process it from there. And they're like literally showing us like pictures of like how you do this and stuff. It was like literally like a, tuto- a tutorial on how to make heroin. Guided, guided tutorial with heroin. visuals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I feel. Mike, I was in, uh, I somehow made it to AP chemistry. <clears throat> I'm hey, pretty sure I'm, I ever made it. I'm pretty sure at one point, I, I can't do word problems. So I didn't do great in chemistry or physics, word but I was problem. great in biology. That's that's all chemistry okay. and physics are to me is word problems. Can't do okay. it. Then what is biology? I'm a little confused. Biology is good. You can you can cut stuff open. You can memorize things. I'm good with memorization. I can't like oh. think on yeah, the I'm fly. Opposite. Yeah. I was a biology major because I wanted to be a doctor and yeah. you know all that kind of stuff. But on, the things I excelled in in school were like chemistry. Like, I, I, I couldn't do it. Organic chemistry, which is like the bane of everyone's existence as a pre-med. Yeah, I could. I it was great. I loved it. I cheated my way through chemistry, but my teacher did write like the <laughs> equation for, for I'm pretty sure it was meth or something on the board. Yeah, at probably. One point. That's how he caught our attention. It's like a simple thing, but I'm sure there's a whole process that goes along to with I mean, making meth chemistry as well. Nerds, man. <clears throat> no offense to everyone out there, but man, they love talking about like the chemistry of drugs. It's like, it's like <clears throat> what makes the, the nerdy organic chemist uh, cool is when he can explain how drugs. Yeah, I think that's what it was too. He was just trying but to like entertaining. catch a bunch of degenerate yeah. high school kids' attention by uh, writing the the equation for meth on the board. He's like, yeah, I know, I know what's cool. I know what's hip yeah, these yeah, days. Yeah. We had this organic chemistry professor who, uh, during one of our labs, goes through like basically. Um, he he well what he was teaching is like a free base equation and like mm-hmm. what it means to have like a free base reaction and how and basically ex- uses uh i guess crack well i guess cocaine all right cuz i think the basically the long story short was after this whole demonstration he was like and that's how you make crack and crack i think is just Free based cocaine, if I'm not mistaken. Based Sounds right. I don't know enough about cocaine crack, and crack. Free based cocaine, I think. Let's look it up. <clears throat> Contra crack cocaine. Yeah. Free basing cocaine just makes crack. It takes a snortable cocaine and turns it into a compound that can be smoked. Smoked. And I think yeah. that's why. People get flagged if they're like buying too much Drano. Yes, yeah. Drano will be used as the free base in the reaction. Mm. To, there's the, there's the a lot of chemicals for. like that that you can you can get flagged if you're buying too much of them for, for whatever yeah. baby drugs. Spray. I mean, at least I used to work at Home Depot many many years ago. And they used to card people for buying spray paint because you could. Huff well, what's what's the the dust off? You could have dust off. You could have anything. To be honest with you. That's true. Ask Steve. I bet Steve yeah. huffs all kinds of stuff. All, all of it. Steve huffs things you don't even want to know about. Anyway, <laughs> how many times are you gonna harass Steve tonight? Anyway, what? Okay, so we've talked. We, yeah, right. we've so we've our rambled for to talk about weed tonight. We've already talked about crack. We've talked about cocaine. And we've talked about heroin. Yeah, but and the, how to manufacture. What else? What else can we have? LSD. LSD was made. Was originally developed to. Uh, it's like help psychiatric patients. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I have no idea. It was oh, like a it's chemically made. Yeah, it, there was a there was a practical wow. use, or they were trying to treat something, and then they ended up just discovering LSD. That wouldn't surprise me, yeah. to be honest. I mean, how many medical discoveries start as accidents? To be honest, yeah. I mean, the reality is, I mean, the the whole point of my original point in all of this was that you know, pretty much like. <clears throat> You have to put things in a category of like organically derived versus like synthetically derived Mm -hmm. because synthetically derived generally you have like a single active compound and that single active compound has like a very predictable response in the brain depending on basically just concentration usually. Like higher concentrations, you get more of an effect. Lower concentrations, you get lesser effect. Whereas, <clears throat> once you start getting into like or like truly organic compounds like weed, 
right? Now you got people growing all kinds of different strains and yada, yada, yada. All right, when you smoke weed, like true, like organic grown weed, not like some lab spice stuff, mm. like that stuff's got so many active compounds. It's like, yeah, obviously we know THC is like the primarily psychogenic compound that people like for getting high. And then I'm sure everybody's heard. In the, I mean, I remember studying CBD as an undergrad neuroscience <clears throat> major, honestly, before anybody was talking about it. Now people talk about CBD all Which the time. It comes from, from the same plant, correct? Yeah. It's the non-psychoactive version of, of weed plant, hemp, correct? Like, uh, yeah. But I mean, to that I mean most weed has both. I mean, well, pretty much has all both. weed has both in it. Yeah. It's just varying ratios. Right. But in general... Like very put things in like very basic bucket of like the summary of what's known. CBD is at least <clears throat> the effect on the brain is generally like non psychoactive and confers most of the positive benefits. Like things that people say are like medical benefits of weed mostly comes from CBD. Now THC, to my understanding, I could be wrong about this mimics a lot of like mirrors i should say mimics mirrors a lot of the similar <clears throat> medical benefits but comes with the psychogenic comes with right effect so why like to my knowledge and i don't obviously i'm not all encompassing knowledge on this topic like i don't know if there's benefits of thc that are not also provided by cbd by cbd okay so if like your true reason, and again, I could be completely wrong about this. I don't know. But my thought uh, process at least is the true reason for <clears throat> using marijuana is for medicinal benefit. CBD is probably most of what you need. Now, there may be some pain might be the one thing that's <clears throat> that's different in that category, right? Like a lot of people use like medicinal marijuana for pain, chronic pain. THC might, I, I don't know. T, I would assume THC probably affects that more than CBD. I don't think people are like popping CBD brownies and like getting like huge pain relief. Like people report getting with. Well, I know they, they, but they do make CBD creams <laughs> that are supposed to help oh, yeah. with like joint pain and stuff. So uh, probably, it, I think inflammation yeah. okay. honestly, is probably more right. what it is. And that kind of makes sense. At least it's hard to say because peripheral effects, when I say peripheral, I mean like outside the brain. Peripheral right. effects are very different than the effects in the brain. Right. And I think yeah. that now we're hitting on, on the thing that's most interesting, right? Like yeah. once something is absorbed by, by the brain fluid and swirled around in your head, like <laughs> why, why is it having the effect that it does? You know, cause we learned oh. about the rivers and the fluids and the tornadoes in your brain. So, um, well, uh, I don't think it's transported by those things allegedly <laughs> to be honest i think it's you know obviously <clears throat> it's transported primarily by the bloodstream right okay you smoke something it goes into your lungs mm -hmm. from your lungs it gets absorbed into your bloodstream and then very rapidly gets to the brain yeah and so what happens when it gets to the brain like so i i smoke a joint right yeah what what is going on once it's in my bloodstream oh. and hits my brain that's yeah. causing me to feel awesome uh like what actually gives you that psychogenic yeah, effect? Yeah, what, what gives you the 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 effects that people associate with marijuana, the yeah. the burnout tendencies, if you will. What what is it in the brain that's uh, happening to cause? Oh, those you want to get into like the I want to get into this. I love this stuff. Honestly, <clears throat> I don't you know. Can, if you can explain it very, we don't have to get all. I don't deep know the answer the to like a lot of the yeah. side effects. To be honest, that actually probably would have been a good thing to look up. To be honest, I've been feeling like such garbage. My motivation to do that's like fair. research on this stuff in the yeah. toilet. But. We can we can do this just strictly off of what you know, your your science background, and let's have well, a discussion around that. I mean, there's basically <laughs> two. Well, I guess there's a lot to talk about here. The simple answer to your question is THC binding to cannabinoid receptors in your brain. That's what makes you feel high. Okay. Now, if you get into like what makes you have like the munchies, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. I don't get the munchies. And like say I'm weird for that. Of, so side effects of smoking marijuana and all that kind of stuff. I don't know the answer off the top of my head to that question. Okay. 
So but, it's, it's it's binding to these that are that are getting absorbed into these receptors. So we're basically taking in THC to our brain through these receptors, which is causing the the different effects. Uh, well, in yeah, a nutshell. basically, <clears throat> yeah. Then you get into all the chemistry of these cells, because basically what happens is <clears throat> it binds to these receptors in your neurons and just changes the way your neurons are acting, basically. Okay. That's and the simple. I mean, there's a you read these art some of these articles I was reading today, and they get into like all the details of like the different types of receptors and the different types of proteins that make up these receptors and how you know because you have different binding sites on receptors um, that cause a hundred different effects inside of a cell. Obviously, I think getting into that kind of stuff. That's going kind of, <laughs> way. <laughs> Sleep. way too over my head yeah, yeah. but the, the simple explanation is thc goes into your brain it binds to receptors actually i mean a lot of different places you binds the receptors on your neurons it binds the receptors on the <clears throat> astroglia microglia i mean pretty much like even non-brain cells in your brain non-neuron cells in your brain have receptors for cannabinoids right i think actually brings up a great question that probably a lot of people don't think about it's like why right like why is your brain even able to respond to these things right like how many things exist out there that have the no world? effect like this yeah. right like if you snorted dirt right is that gonna affect your brain <laughs> I assume it has some sort of effect on your brain i never wrong. tried it <laughs> probably something wrong with your brain if you're snorting dirt to begin with but yeah the idea is right the, like it's not like anything in the world you just like snort it and it's going to get you high right? right your brain has to basically be able to receive the signal like you could send a million signals to your brain if your brain doesn't have a way to receive the signal it's not going to do anything so then the question is like why do our brains have it's almost like in order for your brain to respond to something, right? <clears throat> it has to have a lock that fits the key when the key is flushed through your bloodstream, right? So the question is, why does your brain even have locks that are that fit cannabinoid keys? And the, real, the answer to that question is because we have an endocannabinoid system in our brain. Here, digital media guy says, I get the munchies even when I'm not on drugs. Well, <clears throat> that there is an explanation for that, but we're not getting into that tonight. But so it's uh, called being, the being hangry. By the way, as people are trickling in, we're just having a – I do apologize. I'm <clears throat> a little under the weather tonight. But uh, we're having fun talking about weed, your brain, the effects of drugs on your brain. So if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll answer them. If you can, take a minute. Go down to the YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button. We're getting real close to 10,000 subscribers. Thank you all uh, for being with us and uh, following our channel. So anyway, the question is, like, why does your brain even have a cannabinoid system? Well, that's because your brain makes cannabinoids, right? So <clears throat> even though we found cannabinoids that exist in a plant and we can smoke them to get exogenous, exo meaning from outside the body, exogenous cannabinoids into our body, your brain makes its own cannabinoids. <clears throat> they're different compounds, <clears throat> but they're similar in nature and they act on the same receptors that you know, the endogenous, endo meaning from within your body, the endogenous cannabinoids act on the same receptors that the exogenous cannabinoids from a plant act on. So that's why your brain's even able to respond to it. It's the same thing with opioids, right? Your brain's able to respond to exogenous opioids because it has receptors that read opioids. And the reason our brains develop with opioid receptors are because we have an endogenous opioid system. Obviously, the big difference is <clears throat> our bodies use these things for like very specific purposes. And then you take an exogenous substance and you basically like <clears throat> flood this system with 
stuff that was never intended to be there. And so it's almost like, uh, it's like putting jet fuel inside of your <clears throat> Honda Civic. Like, yeah, I mean, if you stick jet fuel <clears throat> inside a gasoline engine, it'll probably ignite when a spark plug goes off. But, you know, <clears throat> it might burn your engine out because <laughs> it was never intended to work that hard to begin with. I mean, that's how I think about it anyway. Okay. But that being said, I mean, obviously, you know, in moderation, you know, you can enjoy without completely uh, I've a, I have a, the uh, engine out. I have a couple of follow-up uh, questions to this. Mm -hmm. And then the the second one being, we'll get back to, to what's going on with seizures and maybe why this can have an impact. We'll get to the medical stuff. But okay. th that being said, what what is happening differently and you may not know the answer to this but what's happening differently when you ingest it versus maybe smoking it is it just how it's getting absorbed into the bloodstream and is that causing a different effect because like in oh, edible, you mean like you mean like an edible versus yeah. smoking it like, like for me so so smoking marijuana <laughs> has a has a similar yet different effect than ingesting it in like an edible form or fashion can you elaborate on the difference in the effect? It's, so the, the most first-hand experience. So I the can't most, tell you. Yeah, I read about it on the internet. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. All your experience with oh. marijuana, Nordies, from reading about it on the internet. Yeah, you know. Mine too. Yeah, dabbling. Too. In, but so the most common way that it's described is when when you take an edible, it's more of a body high, and it also lasts longer. A body high. A body Can high. You describe a body so high. I'm gonna walk you through the first time this young man ingested an edible never had it before in my life i had i had smoked marijuana but all of a sudden i Buckle couldn't up, guys this I, is gonna be a good one i could not control my head i felt like a newborn my head was just bobbing up and down like i couldn't control it <laughs> and then like i my body felt like it was just going completely numb <laughs> which is very different than when you smoke marijuana it's, it's a completely different like feeling it, going numb? it felt numb and i'm gonna be honest with you like it's fantastic that's my favorite way to consume marijuana is through edibles so huh. because it, it is it's a more it's a it's a body high it's very soothing and you can feel it throughout your whole body versus when you smoke it you feel tired you feel relaxed you feel relieved but it's it's just different and is that because it's going you through like it your digestive your system when you smoke it i guess yeah you'd consider it more of like a, a head space versus an entire body experience yeah interesting mm -hmm. um I don't know the answer to that question. I could probably pontificate about some yeah, ideas. Yeah, the way like, it's going through your digestive <laughs> system, right? So it's getting yeah. broken down and absorbed in different ways, but eventually it's still hitting your brain, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, let's think about some ways that they can possibly vary. Um, are all edibles, <clears throat> do you think most edibles are cooked at some point? Or is it sort of like oil added to an edible that's already? I think there's, cooked? I think there's both, and I like, I'm not the biggest person. Like, I like very low dosage edibles because when I have a high dosage above what's recommended, it's it's not the best experience. So I, I do think a lot of it gets cooked with. There's some stories about that too, but we'll leave that for I another imagine. episode. Is this what happens when you're playing terrible video games? You can't I mean, move arms or legs because you're just high on an edible. There's been a couple of times, yeah. All right, noted. And, noted. and um, <coughs> I, I would assume most of them get cooked, but I do think you can get like an extract or like a, a very concentrated amount that you could just like put on something and still ingest. Yeah. Um, I think it's much more concentrated at that point. So I, I don't know. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about like the contrast between like smoking versus eating is when you smoke marijuana you are <clears throat> you have to burn it to get it into your lungs so that high heat can change an organic compound and when you talk about changing an organic compound i mean something as simple as like you know literally moving a few electrons on an <laughs> organic compound and adding like a hydrogen a, uh, <coughs> uh adding a proton like even though it's maybe the same compound structurally you know you just change it to a different 
I don't know, whatever. I'm just throwing out fancy science terms that could be – some scientist out there could be like, this is the most god-awful explanation I've ever heard um, if you're a chemist. But, you know, if you turn to like different isoform or like who knows, right? Like it doesn't take much chemically <clears throat> to make a compound function very differently. In fact, it's actually like <clears throat> the whole thing of, you know, big pharma, right? Like big, how does big pharma like keep all their patents on all these drugs and all this stuff? And that's why you always see, I don't know, like <clears throat> Zyrtec and I don't know, like Zyrtec Ultra, right? All they do is like take the active compound of like a Zyrtec and then like right before the patent runs out, they're like, oh, they just go to the lab and they're like, yeah, just throw another proton on there. So it's technically a different chemical compound, even though it's functionally, functionally the same, the same, or maybe it makes it a little bit better. And they're like, yeah. oh, shoot, it's actually better. But then now it's a new chemical compound and they can repatent it. Okay. So it's a trick as old as age. <clears throat> the point being, when you burn the compound, it could change it in a small way. I have no idea. In which case, it just functions differently than like a non-combusted form of marijuana. Now, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. I just totally made that up. <clears throat> so, I don't know. If you're a scientist out there... If you're a weed enthusiast and you have an idea of why the effect of edibles and smoking marijuana are drastically different, go ahead. Tell us in the chat what you think. We'll see. Here we go. We got somebody in the chat from <clears throat> MI. Welcome to the chat, MI, or me, or my, whatever your name is. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Are there long term negative effects on cognition? If so, how long do those effects last? Asking for a friend. Completely reasonable. <clears throat> Tell your friend that. So it's not a simple answer, as you'll see. There is no simple answer. But my answer is <clears throat> the prime. Like, the, so the first thing I would ask is why do we have an endocannabinoid system in our brain? Right. We kind of got into that a little bit. Right. The only reason weed affects your brain is because your brain has a natural system already in place that you are born with to read and respond to those types of chemical compounds. If we didn't, weed would have no effect in the brain and it would do nothing for you, good or bad. Well, I can't say good or bad, but no noticeable effect on your brain from like a you can experience perspective. Right, it might feel like taking Tylenol. Who knows? So <clears throat> then you have to ask yourself, why does this natural system exist in the brain to begin with? Well, that's what a little bit of my background research that I focused on before this show um, I was reading about. Basically, like the endocannabinoid system is very precise in the brain, <clears throat> and that's a big difference between taking exogenous marijuana versus the cannabinoids that are naturally produced by your brain. Exogenous, <laughs> exogenous cannabinoids, the cannabinoids that come from plants, they it, it's like a shotgun blast to your whole brain. Whereas the cannabinoids your brain naturally makes, they're secreted in very tight locations of the brain <clears throat> and they disappear very quickly. So it has a very short and very precise form of action, which is very different than cannabinoids that are smoked. That is the exact opposite. It is a high impact action that affects, literally just floods the brain. So two fundamentally different ways that the cannabinoid system is even activated. <clears throat> and the reason the endocannabinoid system, the, the natural cannabinoid system of your brain exists this way is because it plays a very important role in neuron growth and brain development. And so let me paint a little picture for how your brain actually develops. Basically, your brain <clears throat> creates tons of neurons initially. It's like imagine like your brain has to like go through this phase where it grows, like overgrows like a giant bush out in your yard. Then you have to come in <clears throat> in the process of aging and maturing and brain development, especially in your teenage years, are is kind of about your brain <clears throat> sort of shearing the hedge. Trimming it up, getting it to look nice and formed and fully cognitively developed, ready for your adulthood cognition to get destroyed in your 20s by massive amounts of alcohol. Um, and so <clears throat> the whole purpose is that that 
all neurons move and migrate over the course of your life to, and that's how you get neurodevelopment. And so when you consistently, like very often, heavily use marijuana during those developmental years of your life, primarily teenage years, it can have a drastic effect on brain development. <clears throat> now, does that mean if you smoke pot once as a kid, you're going to destroy your brain? No. But <clears throat> it's why there's plenty of, that's why that stereotypical stoner, who's like a stoner for his whole life, is like a stereotype because there's some truth to it, right? You smoke a ton of weed. You jack up your endocannabinoid system for years and years and years during your developmental phase. It's going to have long-term effects on your cognition. Now, does that mean, you know, it's going to completely screw you over in life? No, absolutely not. But it's almost like <clears throat> asking what would have happened otherwise because now we're, I'm more or less addressing the person who's, years removed. They smoked a ton of weed as a teenager and now they're in their thirties and they're wondering if they messed themselves up. Who knows? Who cares? You are where you are right now. Let's take the neuro, the neuropsychologist approach to things. And instead of thinking about what could have been, just focus on what's the path forward. How do you live your best life moving forward? Does that answer your question? I hope it does. I know it was a lot of information, but there was a lot of, uh, I think important information that I wanted to get into, into tonight anyway. So thanks for your question. Really appreciate it. Oh, so what do you think about that, Nordy? I was kind of a little bit of a <clears throat> giant tangent I got on. No, I mean, I think it is good information. This is, at the end of the day, as things become legal and, and what people want to put into their bodies, I think having an educated idea of what's happening to your body with anything. Thanks for your comment, Loto. And anything you put in your body, you should know. Our sincere pleasure. Sorry, what, Josh. I'm no, just no, you're with the chat. Over good. Here. I love, I love the engagement. I love, Listen, I love seeing people ask questions. Like if we put our over. Oh, it pulls it to the side. Oh, okay. New comments display here. Oh, it doesn't show the. <clears throat> it doesn't show the. Uh, it just shows a blank. Yeah. The. Uh, it doesn't show all the previous comments. Interesting. That's interesting. All right. Well. I guess interesting. I don't know why it doesn't uh, show all the previous comments. It only shows when comments come in live. New ones. Okay. I don't want to like smush Josh over and just wait for comments to come in yeah. live. We'll put them up on the screen as they come in live. <clears throat> but any questions you have, leave them in the chat for us. We're happy to answer them. We'll answer them to the best of our ability. If we don't know, we'll just tell you we don't know. Uh, but thanks everyone for who's been coming in. Uh, welcome to the show. We're just having a good time talking about weed, how it affects your brain. Some things we know the answers to, some things we're finding the answers to. But if you want to get notifications every time we go live, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. If you like what we do, we are a nonprofit organization. The only way we're able to do what we do and provide the services that we provide is through the support of our community. You can go to neurosurgerytraining.org slash donate to support our organization. We would really appreciate it. The year's coming to an end. We need as many people to give a year-end contribution as possible. It allows us to do what we do. It allows us to educate future brain and spine doctors. It allows us to <clears throat> produce research to help improve our knowledge about brain and spine health. And it allows us to serve our community. Taking care of veterans and patients with brain and spine injuries is an important part of our mission. And the only way we can do it is with your financial support. So we hope that you'll take a brief minute, go over to our website, <clears throat> which we are actively in the process of rebuilding. We can't wait to show it to you. But again, we need your financial help to get that project finished. So head on over to the website and, uh, Give us a year-end donation if you don't mind. Anyway, back into the show. So <clears throat> where were we going? I think we cut you off about 10 times there. North. That's, that's all right. It's all right. <laughs> always always good to pause for the cause. Always good to see the engagement from the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it's important to, to at least make an informed decision about what you're going to put into your body, whatever it may be. That's that's my personal take on it. Yeah. I like to know the effects that it's having. So I think it's, it's great information. And it kind of leads me to what, what uh, what question or um, our original question oh we got a oh that's actually a great comment go ahead finish your thought nordy i'm going to okay. address this uh comment next but this is a great yeah. comment well i was going to say like this this comes to our next thing and the what started our conversation right is if somebody's told somebody has seizures right and they're told that the cannabis can help with that I do think it's important to know what other effects it may have first and what's happening in your body to even understand that before you maybe make that decision to give it a try. Um, yeah. 
and we'll get into that after after you address this one. Yeah, I mean, this is <clears throat> this is a great comment. Then he used while pregnant, thinking it's safe for an unborn. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of things to unpack here. One, I don't. I think it's hard for anybody to give anybody a definitive guidance on like what is safe and what is not safe. And it's because the only way we can tell anybody anything definitively is when we do research. And it's actually really hard to get research done on certain populations of individuals, pregnant people being one of them or pregnant women, I guess. I don't know. I guess it's very controversial to not say pregnant people. I'm not getting into that. That's not what this show's about. Not we don't do politics on this show. Yep. Pregnant individuals. We're going to leave it at that. Pregnant individuals. <clears throat> it's very hard to do research on these populations. And let me paint you a picture. Imagine you have a great idea. We'll use the, this exact example. You want to know, <clears throat> does marijuana affect unborn children? Well, what's the best way to study something? Take a group of people, expose them to the drug <clears throat> that you want to test, and then take a similar group of people that are not exposed to that drug, trial them out over a prospective period of time, and then compare the results. Now, imagine you're sitting on an ethics committee, and Dr. Rad comes to you with his amazing research proposal that says, I'm going to take a group of 400 pregnant individuals. <clears throat> and I'm going to have them smoke marijuana, use edibles the whole time they're pregnant. And then I'm going to take another group of 400 individuals and tell them not to use drugs. And then I'm going to follow the birth of their children for the next 20 years and see how their brain does develop. Who in their right mind sitting on that ethics committee is going to say, yeah, give a group of 400 pregnant people marijuana and see how their babies develop. It, it's, it's an unethical study. And so it becomes a harder thing to do. The only way you can really do it, let's see, what's our next comment here on that note? Recently, study finally proved the obvious, not safe because <clears throat> the controls of brain growth. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, so you can't- Touched on what you, you were talking about before. Brain yeah. development, THC can have an effect on brain development in those formative years, which a newborn yeah. seems to fall under well, that category. I mean, that's, I mean, you can make the argument from a developmental perspective, like an embryologic perspective. That's really why the endocannabinoid system exists. I mean, it, it has it. The endocannabinoid system, the, the normal receptors in your brain that are designed to respond to these things, they exist- to basically guide organization of the brain during fetal development all the way up through organizational uh, structuring of the brain, even in an adolescence. So yeah, once we started understanding the mechanism of like what is the purpose of the endocannabinoid system, it's a lot. Then you can kind of work backwards and say like, well, we don't really need a randomized control study <coughs> to determine. It's pretty that. safe to it's say. Probably not a good idea. Right. But nobody's going to be able to ever do a gold standard trial to confirm that these obvious things are indeed true. Because it's not uncommon. You get a lot of things in medicine where obvious things, when evaluated in a gold standard trial, turn out to not be as true as you obviously thought they were. Now, when you're factoring in that the only way to confirm this finding would be through an unethical study, we're probably just going to take it at face value based on the mechanism and the plausibility. We're just going to go ahead and say it's not safe. Now, I don't know. What are the potential ramifications for that? I don't know. I mean, in my mind, right? I'm, I feel like I'm not a very sympathetic person to that because I was, I, I never have been, I never really intend to ever be like weed is just never my thing <clears throat> right <clears throat> and it's not like some deep moral conviction right it's not like oh i am i fancy myself such a good person i don't use drugs for whatever reason the way god created me i've never had an interest i'd much prefer to play video games with a clear head frankly or have a glass of bourbon um, and this is this is something we touched on before. You know, my I'm not I'm not a big drinker, but I do enjoy you know marijuana every so often to to yeah. unwind. And so, it's it's funny how though we're we're kind of dispositioned you know differently. Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, so that being said, I just don't think when you're talking about making an argument for like is weed okay, I don't think I'm a great 
advocate for that, right? I don't really have much self-interest in trying to find biomedical reasons why weed is more beneficial than it is harmful. What I can say is in general, right? I mean, eating things are probably a better mechanism of acquiring your delight than smoking something because <clears throat> I don't think we've really um, established anything as potentially beneficial from smoking it, with the exception of like oxygen. <laughs> and even that, actually, I have done been involved in some of this research. You could even make the argument that oxygen is bad for your brain if you're breathing oxygen in like LA where there are like particulate matter pollution ratio is horrible. You know, that was actually some of the initial research I got involved in as a young budding scientist was uh, looking at the effects of air pollution in uh, mice populations. We would literally like take these <clears throat> mice, I guess any PETA viewers out there, just go ahead and turn the stream off. You're not going to like this one. But, uh, Hang on one second. I'm getting I'm getting pinged. I'm getting pinged by a uh -oh. viewer. The viewer's got my personal cell phone. We, we, um, we've been hacked. What do we got here? Sounds like <coughs> what is that? Sounds like Ryan needs to try some indica. What indica. the heck? Do, do so, I want to know? There are two strains of of marijuana. There's indica and sativa. And I've been taught the, the easiest way to keep them separate. One is more of an upper uh, versus one being more of a downer. Indica being the downer and, and relaxing you. You can remember that by in the couch is a good way to remember. <laughs> you will end up in the couch so stoners with have, indica. Stoners have like mnemonics for remembering Mnemonic devices, strains man. of weed now. At the end of the day, we're all just trying to learn, you know, <laughs> be, be educated. Oh, too funny. What was I rambling on about? You were about to talk about slicing open some rats. From, uh, to, you were going to talk about slicing open some rats to see what uh, oh, yeah, yeah. air, oh, air yeah. pollution has yeah. on them. We got PETA supporters in the chat. Yeah. Go ahead and tune out now. Nolan, welcome to the chat. Thanks for tuning in, buddy. We're talking about weed in your brain tonight, but obviously we're getting into all kinds of different drug-related things. I told them our great story about how they taught us how to make heroin when we – while we were in Afghanistan, this is John. Welcome to the chat. John was with me. He uh, was the one who leaned over and was like, uh, Brad, I think the U.S. government just taught us how to make heroin. Yes, they did, Nolan. Yes, they did. Anyway. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Good times. Good times. Um, so what was I getting into? Ah, see, this is cutting great. open the rats, popping Cut. off, and now I'm losing my train of thought. But that's, that's why we do this live. I want so we like hearing from the chat. Cutting open the rats to test for air pollution because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't smoke oxygen anymore because that's bad yeah, for you too. You can't even smoke oxygen anymore. The air pollution is so bad in uh, in LA. Yes, it was uh, our briefing exactly, exactly. Um. So yeah, this study, this lab I worked in, we basically wanted to know like. <clears throat> how air pollution affects your brain, right? Because the idea is like, if you have a stroke, like does the quality of the air you breathe after you have a stroke, like affect your ability to recover from that stroke? That's sort of like the overarching goal of what we were trying to figure out. So we'd literally take like these little rat, col or not rats, my mouse colonies, <coughs> and we like gas them with air pollution. Well, we wouldn't do it. There would be some engineering lab <coughs> at USC that would do it. They'd like gas these mice with air pollution. And then we would uh, do all kinds of like cognitive testing. We would stroke the mice out and then like cut their heads open and take their brains and slice them up and look at how big the strokes were and how well they were able to recover from strokes after uh, having air pollution. It was, it was like my first experience as like a, a scientific researcher. I learned a lot. That's why I worked with King High, the mouse king, uh, which who is obviously not the first time he's come up. But we got another com ch uh, comment here in the chat. Emotional numbing, then later instability, I read. Seen some cranky users. Yeah, I mean. That's, that's something, anytime you're putting a, a for an, an exogenous <clears throat> substance in your body, right? The the normalizing of your system, you don't know how that's going to affect you either. I do think everyone is different yeah. from. Yeah. I from, mean, I think. The, all these. Yeah. <laughs> I think the other, the thing to consider too is, I mean, obviously things are changing now as you get a lot of these like um 
you know, heavily regulated growing facilities. But before when like people had like outdoor growing operations and, you know, all that stuff was like all you had, even like every crop, every plant, your compound, your, when you're dealing with like raw organic material, your active compounds are dr- going to be drastically different in every single use instance <clears throat> and possibly different for every individual, right? Like it, it's so unregulated and so uncontrolled when you just flood the brain with these compounds, like there, there's such like a <clears throat> unpredictable response. I mean, obviously it's predictable in the grand scheme of things, right? I mean, that's why you have different strains where they're like, say, Oh, it makes you feel this way or that way or whatever. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not like a big connoisseur. What was that movie? Tropic? No, no, not Tropic Thunder. What's the other? Pineapple Express. Pineapple Express. Was it? I I remember. I feel like that was a movie I watched while I was in Afghanistan. Because all you do is like go on patrol and watch movies when you have nothing to do. I remember I had this little iPod Nano. It was like this big. And the screen is like this big. And I would literally sit there and like watch movies. And then when you run out of movies, you like wait till you get to like this big transit base and you like find people and you do like crack deals in the back alley of like, Hey man, like I'll trade you these movies on my iPod for uh, something new. I haven't seen before. All right. And see, you end up seeing the most obscure movies while you're in Afghanistan. And I think, I feel like uh pineapple express was, uh was one of those, but like, that was like the strain of weed that they were selling. Right. It was like pineapple right. express or something. I yep. had like some like they all have effect. they all have ridiculous names, in my opinion. Do they still opinion. do that? Do like dispensaries give them ridiculous names? Yeah, yeah. I think I don't think it's the dispensary. It's whoever grows them. Purple Nurple OG Kush. Oh, what was, oh man, what was that? Actually, reminds me. My, I forgot about this. We had like there was like a bunch of guys that got NJP while we were in Afghanistan because they bought like uh, some Afghan Kush from. Uh, some locals and like the whole drug business out there <coughs> is all run by the Taliban. And so basically they're like, well, you just bought local drugs. That money supports the Taliban. Therefore you are being charged with treason. And they were, I literally had to go and sit through their court martial. It's like a, basically like a Supreme court hearing in the desert, basically of like seven guys facing charges for treason. Wild, right? That is wild. It was because also like I'm, as I've already mentioned, like the least sympathetic guy, right? Like I could care. I'm like, why are you smoking weed? Let alone like while on deployment in Afghanistan, like, like keep it in your pants, man. Like, come on. Right. Lock it (laughs) in. focus. They didn't care. These guys, all they want to do is just get high. I'm like, whatever. Fine. I mean, honestly, like considering, you know, when you're literally facing treason charges, you can face everything up to the death penalty. The fact that all these guys got was getting kicked out and sent back to their civilian lives. I mean, they got off easy. You know, that's a win. The reality of how bad it yeah. could have been. I mean, I think that's a testament to, you know, the people judging them, whoever the court yeah. people having, you know, sensibility and not going, uh, you know, yeah. hitting them with a sledgehammer over it, but. I know. It's a precarious situation to be in. Wild stuff, man. I mean, I, the wild stuff. <clears throat> Was it pointless to take Afghanistan? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I do not think the answer to that question is yes, <clears throat> but I'm not a politician. And I don't know the answer to political questions. All I can tell you is that I was compelled <clears throat> Because I felt like it was the right time to serve my country. And service is <clears throat> about going and doing what you are asked to do, regardless of whether or not you agree with it. Question from MI. Were they dishonorably discharged? <clears throat> 100%. Absolutely. <clears throat> there was nothing honorably. Uh, I mean, you can get an other than honorable discharge. They could have gotten another than honorable discharge, but I highly doubt it. It was probably dishonorable discharge for that. If you were facing like true court martial, probably dishonorable discharge. Truthfully, I don't remember. I was, but I did have to be a witness to the cases. It was pretty wild. <clears throat> I was just sitting there minding my own business, and uh, <clears throat> big chicken dinner. 
Yeah, I was just sitting there minding my own business and uh, fixing some broken equipment. <clears throat> oh, bad conduct discharge. What's that, like one step above dishonorable discharge? So I guess you have what? Honorable discharge, other than honorable, bad conduct, <clears throat> and then dishonorable, probably, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what John's getting at. <clears throat> <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. He says yes. All right, there we go. There, there's our answer, chat. He says yes. So, anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, let's see. Where do we leave off? On? I mean, yeah, big. It's a big. I don't know. What questions do you have, Josh? Let's, just, let's get let's get back to the one that we started with. Is what how does this with? possibly medically help somebody with seizures? Oh. We still haven't well, even gotten to the to the, you know, to the original point of the conversation. I mean, here's the thing. I think at least the situations <clears throat> where I would say, even as a physician who does not deal with this stuff on a regular basis, where I would say it's kind of a no-brainer <clears throat> is when you have medically refractory conditions, right? And what I mean by medically refractory conditions is like you've tried every treatment in the book and nothing's working, right? You consider that to be a refractory situation, right? All refra treatment refractory condition. So yeah, there's it's not totally crazy to have an advanced form of epilepsy that's usually genetically related, right? So there's usually some sort of genetic problem that leads to the development of severe epilepsy. And you've tried everything in the book. Like, why wouldn't you try <clears throat> medical marijuana in that case? Right now, obviously, medical marijuana has gone like far beyond like severe refractory cases. Right. I mean, pretty much like <clears throat> like if you sweat a lot, I mean, you can qualify for a medical marijuana card these days. But also, interestingly, <clears throat> this is something that's not talked about <clears throat> very often is uh what they call kind of colloquially pseudo seizures um which is a whole separate situation what do we got here should soldiers decide if they want to invade or not iraq was said to have been without good reason to i don't know the answer to that question i don't think the military <clears throat> enlisted men should be making that choice because that's not how the military works if it was, we can rewrite the Constitution and we can reorganize the entire government structure. But that's not how our government <clears throat> or the military structured. So, no. Uh, my answer to that would be pure chaos. Also, if you've ever met a bunch of 18-year-old horny enlisted men, you don't want to let them be in charge of making a decision about anything. I'll leave that at that. Um, Where were we? Oh, so <clears throat> why wouldn't you try it at that point? Medical yeah, marijuana. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Well, at, I mean, at this point, too, like, I mean, you don't even necessarily have to, to have medical marijuana, but for, for things, I'm sure there is p still people that get directed to marijuana from physicians um, to help something that they they may not have another solution to, like like epilepsy. Say that again? I said, <laughs> you know, weed's legal a lot of places now. You know, so you, if, if it's something like, Hey, you thanks know, for joining us. Yeah. We appreciate it. We're live. Thank uh, you. We'll be back again, 7 PM Tuesday next week. It'll be our last show of the year. We're going to be, uh, our show is happy brawler days. We're talking about head trauma and professional wrestling. So that should be a good one. Don't miss it. 7 PM Tuesday next week. We'll see you. So thanks for joining us tonight. Go on. What were you saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, medicinal marijuana and recreational it's it's all coming from the same place right like i'm sure there's different strengths out there but i'm sure some people are still getting pointed to marijuana from a physician of some well, yeah. capacity i right? think the nice i mean <laughs> the nice thing about the overall more like higher social acceptance of marijuana i think is that physicians today even compared to 10 years ago and maybe things culturally are different in other parts of the country. I think coastally, East Coast, West Coast, um, 
Chicago. <laughs> uh, people are in general <clears throat> have a pro marijuana approach to things or mindset. I don't know. Maybe things are different out in Midwest or other parts of the country. They may still have more of that like conservative marijuana is a street drug, stay away from it type of mentality. That's yeah. fine too. Whatever. My, <clears throat> I think with physicians gaining more of an overall social acceptance, at least in my world being on the East coast, <clears throat> the benefit to it is we treat it more <clears throat> like an alternative form of therapy or an alternative medicine form. And I, I don't honestly, I don't like referring to things as alternative medicine because I mean, obviously I'm biased, right? My wife's a chiropractor. She has a very different view of medicine than I do. And the most important thing is that we challenge, but support each other's differences in how you approach medicine. Me being the much more traditional allopathic physician my mentality, my training, it's all around, you know, you're sort of your more traditional institution of medicine. My wife's not so much. And instead of thinking about, you know, chiropractic and, you know, whatever, herbal medicine and all this other stuff as alternative medicine, and then allopathic medicine is the medicine, they're just different approaches. Our training is different and you have to respect the value and opinion of these different fields. I do fundamentally believe that. So <clears throat> that's sort of a side note. The point is now we're sort of treating, rather than treating marijuana like it's a street drug, we treat marijuana much more like it's in this non-allopathic, non or alternative form of medical care. In which case, a lot of physicians just kind of say like, oh, it's alternative medicine. Like I'm not the expert on this. And other doctors, naturopaths, whoever, they, um, you know, they take up more, much more of like <clears throat> an herbal medicine, like expert uh, perspective on marijuana. And I, I think maybe they would know more than I do. But the point is, we're not treating it as much like a street drug, we're treating it much more like an alternative form of uh, from our traditional allopathic medicine. And when that becomes the issue, we, tr we evaluate things much more in a risk like what is the risk, right? Mm -hmm. We may not know the benefit, <clears throat> but if I can assess the risk and I can counsel you and say like, this is a high risk substance, right? I mean, opioids are a high risk substance, obviously, right? Why mm -hmm. do allopathic doctors constantly prescribe opioids, right? Because there is a known benefit that we have determined outweighs that high risk. Or you could even, I mean, obviously you could make the argument that it doesn't given the opioid epidemic, but that's neither here nor there in terms of the purpose of today's show. Um, but really it becomes more of like a risk evaluation, right? If the risk is high, there better be a really high benefit to outweigh that risk. If the risk is overall low, who cares what the benefit truly is or is not? Give it if a shot. It works for the patient yeah. and they're not putting themselves at risk. Try it as form as, as in terms of a form of therapy. And see how it makes you feel. Even if it's, and this is great. I mean, the placebo can be the best treatment. Even if it's not actually yeah. helping you, but you think and you, like the placebo effect is working, why would I not support that as a physician? Right? I'm not going to lie to you and tell you like, I know that this is fantastic and you should keep doing it. But if you as the patient are telling me you're trying this alternative thing, it's relatively low risk to you and it's making you feel better. Why wouldn't I encourage you to do it? Yeah. If you, if you told me walking outside around the block in the sunshine is curing your pain, why would I tell you to stop doing that? Even though in my mind, I'm like, well, you're not taking any pain medicine. Like maybe getting some extra exercise is the thing that's like helping your pain. But I don't think like walking the same route around your block in the sunshine at the exact same time every day is making your pain better. But if you think that and it's working for you, why would I stop you from doing that? Right? <clears throat> so the question then becomes in certain situations where you don't really, we don't fully know the risk of marijuana or weed. And I think that's when you start getting into like pediatric developmental cases where, you know, you really need to be in a situation where like the child has like severe epilepsy to the point where like medication is not working 
and if they keep seizing, like they're going to burn their brain out and they're going to have severe cognitive deficits from the seizures. And if like, why you like, that's a dire situation where like, just try it. Mm. Right. At least in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, obviously not every case is that simple. <clears throat> that's my sort of my tangent about that. <clears throat> John says, has there been any significant side effects on the brain that are alarming from marijuana? You know, like long-term consequences. Um, I think like, obviously I'm not like a full, I don't have like a full scope of like what the scientific literature is on this, but long-term consequences would be cognitive deficits. If you've used very heavily in key brain developmental periods of your life, i.e. early childhood through adolescence. Right. But that like adult that uses recreationally or, <clears throat> you know, recreationally from a, uh, you know, in a, you know, treat their pain type of thing, you know, not someone who's like literally high 20 hours a day, you know, somebody who uses moderately, just like alcohol. I, I, I mean, I would pretty much just put it in the category of alcohol. Like we know it's not great for you. But as an adult with a fully developed brain, recreational use is, I'm sure, not horrible. <clears throat> Especially if you use like edibles and you're not smoking. Because obviously smoking anything is not great for your lungs. Probably increases your cancer risk significantly. But not really <clears throat> specific to marijuana. That's just if you smoke anything. I mean, smoke paper out of a notebook. Probably increase your risk for cancer. Um, but the other thing we didn't actually talk about is either... Um, side effects of marijuana it actually increases likelihood of uh psychotic breaks and schizophrenia <clears throat> and i think that's also associated with like use during the teenage years so honestly marijuana is not good for teenagers i don't know i mean that's like the typical age where people get into it but i don't mean i would uh i'd probably highly discourage uh <coughs> highly discourage adolescents from using marijuana Increases the risk of schizophrenia, psychotic breaks, and then obviously it's not good for uh, brain development. <laughs> what do we got? John, was it high blood pressure? I know one got much vomiting, but serious. Oh, you're talking about like immediate. Yeah, I mean, there could be some peripheral effects, but honestly, that could not even be <coughs> the actual like marijuana. It could be like, that could be like some extra crap that's like in your plant that you smoked. Like I said, go smoke some paper out of your notebook. I mean, if it's dirty, laced with something, I mean, you could end up with some high blood pressure and some vomiting. You rip a bong too fast, you might get a little nauseous. Not speaking from yeah. experience. Yeah. <clears throat> Stops working, then turn to stimulants. That's actually, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> sort of a side note. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm dying over here. Everyone's sick. Um, I was asked to look this up, and I did a little bit of research on the effects of... The question was basically like, how does marijuana affect ADHD? <clears throat> and I was like, oh, that's an interesting question. Right? Because ADHD is typically people, they struggle with attention, and they struggle with hyperactivity. So... <clears throat> You know, you think, oh, somebody's too hyper, right? You got to calm them down. But then you're like, well, why do we treat ADHD typically with, with stimulants, right? With, um, what is, what is, what's the big one? Ritalin? No, the other one. Adderall? Adderall. Because yeah. Adderall is a stimulant. Ritalin right. is too. Methylphenidate. Yeah. Okay. I mean, methylphenidate is basically. I'm more familiar with not Ritalin. I'm already blanking. I mean, Ritalin was like the original. That was the original. That was like, that was yeah. like the OG ADHD yeah. treatment. I mean, it's still used commonly. <laughs> You're a digital media guy. One bong rip a day keeps the doctor away. Wise old say. All these wise. Age old. <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe <laughs> until you end up with lung cancer and then uh, you can't get out of the doctor's office. But, uh, 
<laughs> maybe one ball of grip won't, won't, won't be a little cleaner bad. there's you're not ingesting paper you know it's it's getting filtered through the water maybe some ice cubes in there you know keep it smooth i have no idea i, not mean, the, I just read it on the internet so oh yeah, yeah, yeah. just read yeah. it on the internet yeah. got, it, got it in a book it was in a yeah. book i mean <clears throat> so the anyway the idea with adhd and obviously i don't know how much of this we truly know versus like kind of speculation but um <clears throat> the traditional thinking with adhd is it's like an under stimulation of the brain and like they don't know what to do with themselves because their brain is so under stimulated <clears throat> and that's why they treat it with a stimulant. why coffee calms them down but i think that's like very traditional <clears throat> traditional uh adhd and again, Travis Childer says, my grandmother said the same thing. Thanks for joining, Travis. Or uh, tell your grandmother we said hi. Um, and yeah, car crashes. Thanks for the comments. We appreciate it. Honestly, it's been a lot of fun having the chat. So, it's been, been a lot of fun. Today. It's been a good one. But yeah, no, this is exactly it. If I knew the chat would be so lively, we could have just put the chat up. That way people can talk to each other a little yeah. bit more obviously we got people on twitch we got people on youtube we got people on linkedin uh, joining us um but uh so the thought would be <clears throat> this is my thinking and again i'm kind of just making this up because people are like not sure if weed actually helps with adhd i think that if you have like very traditional adhd <clears throat> that responds very well to methylphenidate or another stimulant, you probably have a very like true diagnosis of like the original thought of ADHD. <clears throat> now, this may be considered a very controversial statement, what I'm about to say. So if you don't have a perspective of being able to, one, acknowledge that maybe I'm wrong, or to consider a different point of view, it is possible that ADHD is overdiagnosed today. And there's a lot of factors that could contribute. I think there's a possibility that there's like true biological ADHD, and then there's like environmental ADHD. And I'm making this up. Disclaimer, I'm making this up as I go. These are just sort of like my thoughts. Imagine I'm like Jordan Peterson, just sort of pontificating, coming up with things on the fly. Right. This is not scientific knowledge. Do not quote me that this is in a textbook. There's like biological ADHD and then there's like more environmental ADHD. Biological ADHD, I think, is what our original traditional thought was of like under stimulation. You need to promote stimulation and dopamine, like you, like dopamine release in the brain to address under stimulation. That's why stimulants work well for these patients. Coffee works well. Other people, I think they struggle with attention. They struggle with this, that, whatever. And it's probably environmental. And I'll give you a great <clears throat> example. I struggled a lot with attention while I was in medical school. While I was in medical school, my wife was living on the other side of the country. <clears throat> and I was struggling with depression because being separated from my support network while going through this intense training process of medical school was challenging for me. <clears throat> and I think a secondary effect of that was my attention really struggled. Well, the doctors wanted to treat me with <clears throat> methylphenidate. And in one way, I agree with their treatment plan in that you can't change the environment. You need to address the symptoms so that way the student can study and get the work done that they need to do. But I don't think that being treated with a stimulant to address my attention issue at the time, disclaimer, lo and behold, I moved back <clears throat> in with my wife. We have a wonderful life now. I do not have depression. I do not have attention issues anymore. It all magically went away when my environment changed. All right <clears throat> now, um, and I think there's a lot of people that fit in that category, but then they sort of get diagnosed with ADHD put on stimulants <clears throat> and what happens when you put somebody who might not have biological ADHD, but more environmental ADHD on a stimulant? <clears throat> well, they're basically high on speed. And honestly, that's what happened to me. I remember my heart raced. I lost tons of weight. I mean, yeah, even 
people with biological ADHD, they'll lose weight on a stimulant. But like, I basically was just on speed for like months at a time. I, could, I was terrible sleep, blah, 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 blah. And <clears throat> I'll weigh in on this too once you're done. What's that? I've, 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 oh, yeah. I've, yeah. So <clears throat> then what do these people do? Well, they start to struggle to, they still struggle for attention because now they're on speed. And they smoke weed. And what does weed do? <clears throat> well, overall, weed has a dampening effect on neurologic activity, right? That's why weed dampens seizure activity. It will have an overall dampening effect on global neurologic activity. And so it's like, <clears throat> you ever see a movie, well, Wolf on Wall Street, where he's like rambling all these different drugs he takes. And he's like, basically, I get high on this. And then I got to take this to take the edge off from all the coke and blah, 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 blah. Just to Quaaludes. You know. Yeah, right? <clears throat> That's basically what's happening, I think. I think people are people who do not have biological ADHD, they have environmental factors, they're being treated with stimulants. Then the stimulants are getting basically revving them up on speed and then they smoke weed and it levels them out and they feel better and they go, great, weed's treating my ADHD. That's my hypothesis. <clears throat> I don't know if any of that's true. I don't know if any of that makes sense. Maybe it's all a bunch of lies. And there's some neuroscientist out there who's going to watch our podcast and call me a hack. Fine. But until somebody educates me on a more scientifically correct explanation, that's that's kind of my mental framework for thinking about these but things, that, at least from what I've read. Well, and I never even thought about that, but <laughs> diagnosed with ADHD right here, given stimulants, helped me focus, didn't didn't affect my eating habits, didn't affect my sleep. And stimulants typically don't make me jittery. Like I drink yeah. a ton of coffee, it doesn't make me jittery. It almost calms me down. Um, yeah. and, and weed, if I, if I smoke weed, it doesn't give me the ability to focus at all. Like can't yeah. focus on it. Does it, I can't be productive yeah. when I'm smoking either strain of weed. So, so my, I, I think there's some weight there. Yeah. I think like, my just from my personal experience, yeah. I think my hypothesis would be if you are smoking weed and saying it's helping with your ADHD, the question that I would ask is, do you have the correct diagnosis of ADHD? Because you couldn't just be trying to take the edge off from whatever stimulants you're on. Because you will, right? We self-seek things that don't make us feel good. Yeah. So on that note, <coughs> join us Tuesday, 7 p.m. next week for Happy Brawler Days, where Josh is getting amped up to talk about CTE and head trauma and professional wrestling. And CTE, it's going to be a good one. CTE, concussions, <laughs> broken necks. We're going to get oh, into yeah. all of it. It's going to be fun. I cannot claim to be a professional wrestling connoisseur, but I can honestly say Josh's enthusiasm for professional wrestling is wearing off. I might just show up in a spandex singlet. Actually not, even though I was a very avid wrestler in my uh, younger life. I will not be streaming in a spandex singlet. But I don't know. Maybe if we get maybe maybe if we get like <clears throat> 10 maybe if we get to 10,000 subscribers and like Maybe like a thousand in donations, I'll do it. Actually, I'll just throw it out there. If we hit ten thousand subscribers, <clears throat> which we're close, and get a thousand dollars in donations before Tuesday's stream, I will show up in a spandex singlet. I you you have my Eagle Scouts honor. Well, I used to Eagle Scouts honor. This is the Cub Scouts. Eagle Scouts honor. All right. You have Scouts honor. I will show up in a spandex singlet if that criteria is met. Uh, if you want to help, help us out, <laughs> we are a nonprofit organization, so we need everyone's help to keep the mission going to, uh, educate future brain and spine doctors to take great care of our patients. We need help creating new research programs to improve our knowledge and care for brain and spine health and to serve our community. We've got lots of great community service projects that we're starting. We're starting a veteran support group, a veteran's health advocacy program, and a patient support group all coming in early 2023. We're in the planning stages right now. We need help financially funding these programs because we cannot do it <clears throat> without your help. So if you want to make a year-end contribution before we wrap up, you can head to neurosurgerytraining.org slash donate and leave a donation. Everything's tax deductible to the full extent of the law wherever you live. We are a nonprofit organization. On that note, join us Tuesday at 7 p.m. Don't miss it for Happy Brawler Days, 
all things professional wrestling and neurotrauma. Can't wait for it. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We had a great conversation tonight. It was a blast. People love talking about drugs, I guess. I just don't share the affinity Who doesn't love the real trends? world experience, but I'm happy to talk about it. I love the brain. I love the spine. Why not talk about things that mess with the brain? All serious. I think the, the effects that drugs have on the brain is fascinating. I do think yeah. it is great for people to educate themselves and the conversation uh, was great. Love the engagement. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Love all tuned the new faces in. today. Yeah. Really. We hope you guys come back on Tuesday, 7 p.m. to talk about uh, professional wrestling. Pass the Dutch. <laughs> Oh man. All right. Somebody's got it. Somebody go check on this guy. Make sure uh make sure he's doing okay. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you Tuesday next week, 7 p.m. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and head over to our website and leave a donation. We'll see you next week. <laughs>